perhaps I can start with the details, technical details, because I think yes. um, the participants are more interested in what you are going to say than in what I'm going to say. So welcome. Uh, my name is Fabienne Desieux. I'm a researcher at the Department of Sociology at the University of Vienna, and I'm a board member of the International Carp Lyme Society, and I will be your moderation for the lecture tonight. Before introducing our guest, Fred Block, and our commentators, Brigitte Auenbacher and Bernhard Kittel, I will give you some short, brief organizational and technical uh, information for our event tonight. Um, the lecture um, pathway, a path out of the crisis, envisioning a post-COVID world uh, by Fred Block is a part of an event series hosted and organized by the Department for the Theory of Society and Social Analyzers at the, of the Institute of Sociology at the Johannes Kepler University Linz of the Gesellschaft für Kulturpolitik, Institut für Angewandte Entwicklungspolitik, Institute for Multilevel Governance and Development at the Wirtschaftsuni Wien, the International Karpolanik Society, the TU Wien, and uh, the Wissensturm, as well as the Volkshochschule Wien. And it's also in cooperation with the Arbeiterkammer Wien and the Arbeiterkammer Oberösterreich. Um, Tonight, uh, our event, event will be opened by a lecture by, um, the, by Fred Block uh, on the topic Path Out of the Crisis, Envisioning a Post-COVID World. And afterwards, Brigitte Auenbacher and Bernhard Kittel will comment the lecture. And Fred Block will have the opportunity to react, to react, to react sorry, to these comments instantly. Thereafter, there will be the opportunity for the audience to ask questions. If you have a question, please place a dot or raise your hand, uh, a dot in the chat or raise your hand, and I will call you. You can ask questions in German or English. In case you ask a question in German, I will translate it into English. Our lecture tonight will be recorded, so please be aware that your name will be on the recording if you ask a question. In Zoom, you are able to change your name if you are not agreeing uh, with seeing your name spotted, um, please change it. During the talk, please mute yourself and please um, turn off uh, the video so we will have a better connection, hopefully because as Brigitte and myself pointed out earlier, we have some difficulties with our own internet connection, so, but we will get through. So enough on the technical onboarding for our tonight's event. I will tell you a little bit more about the um, main person tonight. Fred Block is a critical intellectual who has written widely on issues of politics and political economy, as we all know. And right now he's um, Vienna Karl Polanyi visiting professor for the winter term in 2001. He is a research professor of sociology at the University of California, Davis. He also serves as a president of the Center for Engaged Scholarships. Fred's wide ranging writing covers topics such as state theory, the organization of the international monetary system, changes in the US innovation system and the prospects of the radical reforms in the US society. His work has drawn heavily on the writing of the Hungarian refugee and the intellectual Karl Polanyi, as we all know, which is why he's here today too. Fred has served the broad uh, served on the board of the Karl Polanyi Institute of Political Economy since 1989. He has also been a member of the editorial board of politics and society for many years. Three of his recent publications has been Capitalism, the Future of an Ill Illusion, which was published in 2018. Another book he's co-authored with Margaret Somers is The Power of the Market Fundamentalism, Karl Polanyi's Critique, which was published in 2016. The third book published and edited by Black Fred Block together with Matthew Keller in 2011 
is state of innovation, the US government's role in technology and development. And I will also add some brief information to our commenta to our commentators of tonight even of tonight's event and I will do that in an alphabetic order. So I will start with Brigitte Auenbacher. Brigitte Auenbacher is a professor of sociological theory and social analysis, the head of the department for the theory of society and social analysis at the Institute of Sociology, which she's heading right now too, uh, at the Johannes Kepler University in Linz in Austria. She's also the vice president of the International Kapellans. Uh, society. Her main research topics are social theory and analysis of capitalism, sociology of work and, and, and industry, sociology of care, research on welfare state, gender and intersectionality. I will also name three public, recent publications of Brigitte Auenbacher. One recent publication pub, written together with Johanna Krugner in two, published in 2021 is Work Labour perspectives from the sociology of work and industrial sociology on the transformation of paid work, which was public in sociology in the German speaking work, the special issue of Soziologische Review. Um, she also edited um, a book together with Hermann Lutz, Lutz and Karin Schwitter, in which, which was published in 2021. It is, its title is Gute Sorge ohne gute Arbeit. Live in Care in Deutschland, Österreich und der Schweiz. This book is drawing on a project he, she co-chaired with her co-editors, uh, Decent Care Work, Transnational Home Care Arrangements, which analyzes 20, analyzed 24-hour care in Austria, Germany, and Switzerland. And one last publication, she's edited uh, several publications and has written several texts and papers on Polanyi and Polanyi's work and further developing it too. And one uh, of the books she edited together with several others like Roland Atzmüller, Ulrich Brandt, myself, Karen Fischer and Birgit Sauer is Capitalism and Transformation, Movements and Counter Movements in the 21st Century, which was published in 2019. The third person um, who will talk to you today is Bernhard Kittel. Bernhard Kittel is Professor of Economic Sociology and Head of the Department of Economic Sociology at the University of Vienna and is also co-funding and co-organizing the visiting professorship of the International Karpulani Society. And his main, main research areas are experimental social justice research, as well as experimental committee decision-making and election research employment and labor market research, and international comparative analysis of welfare states and industrial relations. I will also name three of the current publications by Bernard Kittel. He co-edited uh, a book on in, uh, which was published in 2021 uh, under the title Intergenerational Transmission and Economic Self-Sufficiency, which was published by Paul Craig McMillan. Furthermore, he has published uh, in 2021 uh, um, a work on conquering the labor market, the socioeconomic enablement of refugee women in Austria, comparative migration studies together with David Chistel and uh, Martine Maite Imbanes Bollerhof. The third publication I choose to tell you about today also published in 2021 by uh, Bernard Kittel and uh, some co-writers is Making and Breaking Coalitions, Strategics, Sophistication and Pro-Sociality pro in Majority Decisions in the European Journal of Political Economy. So as you all can see, or as you all heard, we are really happy to have three experts on economy, politics from different perspective. And we are really happy to have, especially Fred Block for the talk tonight. And I would ask you to start your lecture on the topic of um, pass out of the crisis, envisioning a post-COVID world. Thank you so much for that kind 
introduction, Fabienne. And I um, want to say hello to uh, various um, old and um, 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 new friends who are um, uh, here. And um, I want to express my gratitude to the uh, International Carl Polanyi Society for providing this wonderful opportunity to visit, albeit only virtually Austria. I look forward uh, to the opportunity after COVID, if that ever happens, uh, when I can uh, visit Vienna in, in reality. I also want to thank the um, the various people who are making the um, technology um, work here, because um, um, I, I realize that we're constantly in danger of um, technological malfunctions, and um, I'm grateful that that hasn't happened so far, and I'll knock on wood to make sure it doesn't. So what, what I'm going to do today is um, briefly um, start by um, summarizing what I said in the first lecture in Vienna, because I kind of uh, saw these as a, a pair, a continuation of the same theme. And then I'll talk about uh, what I want to talk about today. So in that first lecture, I argued that we um, face a crisis of democratic governance uh, today that's similar to the crisis in the 1930s. Uh, both then and now support for parties and politicians of the political center has been in decline and a process of polarization has strengthened uh, political movements on both the right and the left. Um, as well as those movements like the Five Star Movement in Italy that reject the standard political spectrum altogether. Um, those, the, polariz the resulting polarization has destabilized politics. It's made it more difficult for uh, governments to um, carry out any policies as we've seen with the, the difficulty um, that governments around the world have had in responding effectively to a pandemic, which one would think under ordinary circumstances would bring people together rather than drive them further apart. I, I root this polarization, um, the current crisis um, in the politics of austerity that have made governments far less responsive to their citizenry, citizenry is uh, less able to protect people from the vagaries of markets. Um, but I also stressed in that first talk that we shouldn't think of that distress in purely materialist terms, either in the 30s or today, as we learn from Polanyi, um, that um, this process of polarization, of disillusionment with the center is also cultural. It uh, generates a widespread feeling, even among those who might be economically secure, that the center has lost touch with the values of ordinary people, that, and the center cannot be trusted to uh, pursue uh, intelligent policies. Um, and um, I then argued that um, in response to the dislocation in both these historical periods, um, one gets two kinds of protective counter movements. One um, that's inclusive, that seeks to unite the many against the few, and the other which is exclusive, that um, is the politics of the authoritarian right that focus hostility on immigrants, Jews, Muslims, um, outsiders. Um, and this polarization make, further makes um, uh, effective governance difficult. Um, finally, I stressed how close the US came um, in early 2021 to a coup that uh, would have kept Donald Trump in power, even though he had uh, lost the election by all indications. Um, and I stress that even if um, those of you in Europe who are feeling uh, relatively secure about your democracies, that if the US were to slide into the authoritarian camp, uh, the pressures on European democracy would be um, um, even stronger than, or substantially stronger than they are today. So um, I want to propose um, today a kind of path out of the crisis. And so um, my argument in brief is that to protect um, 
democratic institutions, um, democratic practices, we have no choice but to deepen de democratic governance um, and shrink the divide that separates ordinary people from the political class in most of these societies. But I, I wanna start with a diagnosis that goes even a little deeper than what I argued in the earlier talk, um, that um, austerity itself, I would argue, it has a symptom of a deeper problem. Um, and this um, diagnosis in turn um, leads to a kind of more radical political program um, that I see as the kind of great challenge of the next um, decades. Um, so I, I'm arguing in, in brief that central solutions can't get us out of a crisis that um, was precipitated by the collapse of centrist uh, politicians and political regimes. Uh, we need a radically different direction, a series of structural reforms on the scale of the New Deal or the transformation that happened in Europe in the years immediately after World War II. Um, I think the talk of a Green New Deal, of a global Green New Deal is totally appropriate, but because that slogan covers a multitude of possibilities, I want to talk more specifically about the features that such a policy must have if it's to prove durable. And I also want to argue that even though um, the threat of the authoritarian right is acute in many places, um, we also know from historical experience um, that periods of extreme polarization can be overcome um, short of um, of catastrophe, either in the form of um, civil conflict um, or um, the the triumph of authoritarianism. Um, the in the historical record, we've seen extremely formidable social movements of both the right and the left collapse rather abruptly. Um, that they they seemed as though they were carrying the day, and then. Uh, fair, in a fairly short period of time, um, they experience demobilization, um, disappearing mysteriously like pandemics, um, uh, because activists become burned out, imprisoned, co-opted, whatever, and um, the movement shrinks back to a, a shadow of its former self. Um, so. For that reason, I believe that structural reforms could facilitate the marginalization of the authoritarian right. I mean, essentially, we learned from Polanyi that movements gain strength from structural opportunities when many people feel uh, anxious and unmoored from the existing institutions because they they have not been protected either in a material or a cultural sense. Um, once people again feel protected from dislocation and disorder, uh, such movements shrink back to a handful of ideologues. But what kind of structural reforms am I talking about? My, my answer is rooted in my own intellectual history, needless to say. Um, and a big part of that is that I've been engaged with post-industrial theory for more than 50 years now. I to say it makes me sound old. Uh, but um, Daniel Bell was my teacher as an undergraduate, um, even before he had published his uh, major work, The Coming of Post-Industrial Society. Moreover, there was a current within the American New Left um, that was very explicit in its embrace of a theory that um, the movements of the 60s, the transition that the U.S. society was going through at that time was a transition away from industrial society. But that while I, I've always been attracted to the power of post-industrial theory, there's always been a fundamental vagueness um, in, in the theory, um, a vagueness around what is the what are the principles of this new historical epic that we're supposed to be transitioning into? So we know, for example, that in agricultural society, most people worked on farms. Uh, we know that in industrial society, the dominant form of, of 
um, economic activity was working in, in factories. Um, in post-industrial society, we have this idea that most people are working in the service sector, but the service sector is such a diverse and heterogeneous category, extends from care work to business services, um, that it doesn't give us much purchase on what is the character, the emergent character of, a, of an industrial um, a, um, it doesn't give us much purchase on what is the character of that post-industrial social order. Um, the content of post-industrialism remains kind of mysterious or undefined. So in struggling with this issue over many years, it occurred to me that um, Polanyi talks about in the one of the early chapters of the Great Transformation, um, the conflict between habitation and improvement in pre-industrial England. Uh, he deliberately used kind of the old fashioned terminology um, from the conflicts of that time. Improvement is technological progress um, in the case of uh, that he's talking about um, um, the um, wealthy farmers began enclosing the commons um, uh, turning um, fields into grazing land for uh, sheep. Um, and in Polanyi's argument, um, this had destructive uh, consequences for um, the, the rest of the rural population that had been used to um, grazing their sheep on the commons or um, working these fields and so forth. So, Polanyi describes this kind of fundamental conflict between the logic of, of improvement and the logic of habitation. And by habitation, he means um, the ability of people to construct um, both the physical, social, and cultural aspects of the, of the communities in which, in which they live. So um, it, another way of saying this is that he argued that people have always created their habitation, uh, their living spaces, uh, their social spaces, um, but that in agricultural society and in industrial society, uh, they did this in the interstices, in the background, um, while they spent much of their time um, working on, on farms or, or factories, and that this habitation was repeatedly disrupted by the logic of, of improvement and um, the, you know, that in the industrial revolution, uh, people were dragged into um, the horrid industrial cities of, of early industrialization, um, living in, in um, shanty towns and forced to kind of reconstruct their habitation from scratch, you know, under difficult circumstances. Now, what occurred to me is that this concept of habitation uh, provides us with a way of understanding the actual content of post-industrialism, because essentially the largest category of employment um, in our current societies are people who produce and maintain the physical and social infrastructure of the communities in which we live. That, so this includes construction, retail trade, health services, education from preschool to um, PhD, uh, local government, the arts and entertainment, and um, a number of other categories. So from the point of view of employment, we already live in a habitation society. Most work is the work of constructing, maintaining um, the, the communities in, we, in which we live. But the paradox um, is that while all of us consume this habitation and many of us, most of us, are producing it in the work that we do and in our informal activities in uh, maintaining our households, um, we do not produce this habitation. Uh, we do not make it as we please to you know, reference Marx's um, men make their own history. Men and women make their own habitation, but they do not do it um, as they please. In fact, 
collectively, um, we have very little power to shape what our communities look like physically or socially. Uh, we have very little voice in how they develop of, of what they're going to look like in 10 or, or 20 years. Now, the reductio ad absurdum of, of this lack of agency over habitation um, has been the uh, what's gone on in China, where the government has, in anticipation of displacement of people from the countryside, has built these new cities from scratch. Um, and in some cases, they've they're essentially been ghost cities because the uh, migration from the countryside hasn't taken place. And so you have these um, rows and rows of huge apartment blocks and, you know, retail stores and so forth, um, but that there's nobody, nobody there. Um, I would argue that um, in the West, um, it's not as extreme as that, but we also lack a collective agency over um, the shape of, of habitation, of the habitation that we, um, we consume, whether it's cities, suburbs, um, towns, and so forth. Um, and this is because of practices and institutions from the industrial era that very deliberately took questions of habitation um, out of the realm of ordinary politics so that um, it's business elites, uh, technocratic elites um, that make the critical decisions about um, what our habitation should look like. And we know that you know, this has given rise to various forms of contestation that there have been few huge fights in various countries because um, the authorities decide to build an airport in some place that people don't want an airport. It disrupt, disrupts their habitation and they mobilize ferociously to, to resist them. So my point um, is that in both economics and politics, um, we're, we're, we're struggling to make old models work. Um, in economics, the way I think about this is that we're still trying to kind of squeeze economic growth out of the mass consumption model that contributed to the dynamic growth of the Trente Glorias, the 30 years after World War II. Um, that model was built around uh, single family homes, suburbanization, the automobile and so forth. And we know that model cannot uh, even though we're trying to keep it going, it cannot work anymore because it was based on intensive use of fossil fuels. Uh, the suburban land uh, disappeared and that set of lifestyles no longer fits with what people want and need. Um, and so we live in a period where um, by all accounts, capital is abundant, um, but investment of um, in physical, things in production and infrastructure is um, at low levels um, and capital is sloshing around the global economy. I think I said in the previous speech, we already have $2 trillion invested in various cryptocurrencies that um, nobody knows what they're actually um, for, but it's you know $2 trillion that could be um, financing um, improvements that actually made a difference for, for real people. Um, so um, my solution um, flows obviously from this diagnosis that um, the solution to both the economic problem and the political problem is that we must democratize this habitation, um, give people much greater control over the habitation that they consume and produce, whether it's urban, suburban, or rural. Um, and obviously in the context of climate change and the climate crisis, um, this means prioritizing uh, sustainability and resilience in, in all of our settlements and our communities so that we can um, reduce the, the climate change threat and adapt or protect ourselves from the 
um, the hurricanes, floods, and um, other fires and other disasters that climate change is producing. So what would be required for people to gain uh, real control over the habitation that they consume and produce? So I, I think of kind of four um, critical steps in, in the process of transformation. Um, the first is that we need um, big shifts in fiscal policy. And so in all of the developed market society, the bulk of taxation of tax revenue um, is monopolized by the political center and subnational entities um, have um, um, been durably deprived of the revenue the required um, to exert greater control that it, in most cases, um, big infrastructure projects require the central government to agree to, to provide uh, funding. Um, that, and, and essentially the kind of ongoing fiscal tension um, at the subnational level is also um, what produces political stalemate there because um, there are never enough resources to um, provide non-zero-sum solutions to conflicts over what the habitation should look like. Um, if there's you know, money to upgrade neighborhoods, there's a zero-sum conflict over which neighborhood is going to get upgraded. Um, so one would need to restructure fiscal policy so that uh, more of the tax revenue is being held um, held on to um, at subnational um, levels. Um, and of course, that would also involve um, some greater redistribution to balance out um, that um, um, to, to bring up the resources that um, that less favored um, regions or cities or towns um, are, are able to get now. The, the second is a big shift in credit policy. And um, as I said, that financialization has uh, meant that there are huge um, flows of financial resources into cryptocurrencies, into derivatives, into speculation in a wide range of different financial assets. Um, so we have within we have it in our power um, to restructure our financial systems um, so as to cut off um, that flow of of resources, or at least dramatically diminish that flow of resources into speculative finance and redirect it um, into financing um, the infrastructure, the affordable housing, um, the small business, the nonprofits, the community oriented groups. Um, and um, we've, um, in all of these societies, we've done this before. We've, um, re revised and restructured financial institutions uh, to shape the flow of capital to finance activities that previously hadn't been financed. Um, we could do this again. And I have a forthcoming edited book that's in the uh, Real Utopia series that my late colleague Eric Olin Wright started. Um, and our volume is on democratizing finance, which kind of lays out an agenda for a different structure to uh, national financial systems that would um, increase the flow of resources into um, financing um, habitation and giving people um, much greater control over what that habitation looks like than they currently have. And again, I'm not saying that every project um, that people wanted to do would be financed, but what I'm saying is that um, there are all kinds of needs that could be financed at uh, interest rates that are three or four percent that um, are feasible and sustainable. Um, the third kind of change is that we need to make a transition from the market driven marginalization of uh, sectors of the population in our in our cities and towns uh, to policies of inclusion. So um, 
a market-driven housing system, uh, whether we're talking ownership or rental, um, squeezes out the poor, pushes them to the margin um, in the U.S. has created uh, a massive issue of, of homelessness. And um, the reconstruction, the democratization of our habitation um, requires that we put a floor under all people to provide them um, with adequate housing, adequate health care, um, um, other necessities, um, rather than tolerating the kind of um, ex exclusion that's been driven by the, uh, the market. Finally, and, and I think most critically, um, we need to see big shifts in governance institutions. Um, and basically the idea here is that we need a, a very significant um, expansion of participation in governance at the subnational level um, in, in local communities, in cities, um, in states and provinces, what, what, um, whatever we uh, call them. And, you know, we, we have a sense of the possibility here because um, over the last decade, we've seen the rapid spread around the world of the uh, participatory budgeting schemes that were first uh, developed in, um, in cities in Brazil, uh, the idea being that uh, citizen assemblies are given a voice in deciding how a portion of the municipal budget would be spent and they get to decide whether it's this infrastructure project or building sewers over here or, or whatever. Now, this has spread very rapidly across the world, but we also know that it's flawed because uh, there hasn't been a big expansion in the resources that are available to these uh, municipal governments. And so uh, people are continuing to fight over, over crumbs. Um, if we had um, the restructuring of tax and credit regimes, um, we could imagine a situation where people are um, assembling to make um, decisions over very substantial resources. So um, that obviously the precise institutional forms um, through which to organize these higher levels of citizen participation um, are going to require a lot of experimentation. Um, it, it might be citizens, some combination of citizen assemblies, referenda, new elected bodies. Um, but the basic idea is uh, the very old one um, that through meaningful participation, uh, people at the local level will gain a, a set of fundamental political skills, um, how to read budgets, how to make uh, political arguments, how to fight for their needs, and that that process of expanded participation will then help to narrow the gap so that when they go to elect their representatives to national parliaments, um, they will be more knowledgeable, more skillful, uh, more able to hold those politicians to account and shift the balance of power so that um, their representatives would um, listen less to the oligarchs and the billionaires and more to, um, to um, uh, people. Okay, so the, that brings me then to the next question, which is, um, is this idea of the democratization of habitation a feasible goal? Is it economically viable? Is it politically viable? Is it not just another utopian vision? So let me look at these issues in turn. So I would argue that it's certainly viable um, economically. Um, again, coming back to, we are both producing and consuming this habitation so that if we democratize the production of it, we're more likely to get the habitation that we deserve. So for example, if one thinks about healthcare, um, that it seems, it seems to me that kind of part of the 
of the resistance to vaccination around COVID um, is that people experience the healthcare system, even where, you know, um, their access to it is guaranteed as bureaucratic and impersonal and unresponsive to them. So if we were to democratize habitation, it would give people more control over the way in which they experience the healthcare system over the degree of responsiveness to individuals. And so um, we would in fact improve people's standard of living by democratizing habitation. Um, also kind of on this economic level and very briefly since I don't wanna to spend too much time on it, um, the idea of democratizing habitation fits very closely with the current global preoccupation um, with increasing innovation um, to compete more effectively in the global economy. Because we know that the innovation process has a critical local dimension. This argument has been developed most recently by Dan Bresnitz in Toronto in a book called Innovation in Real Places. Uh, but his argument is that the capacity um, to make critical innovations that um, um, improve a locality, a region's position in the global economy um, involves the development of capacities at the local level, um, in, involves uh, developing forms of governance coordination. And so it's extremely compatible with the idea of democratizing habitation. So one can think about um, that various forms of um, new forms of um, of retrofitting of old buildings to make them energy efficient and reduce the, the burning of fossil fuels, uh, that localities that innovate in this area uh, would both improve their own situation and earn foreign exchange by exporting the expertise to, to other places. Um, furthermore, you know, we know that uh, increasing our investments in infrastructure, in affordable housing, in small businesses, in cooperatives, nonprofits, um, will be productive as compared to the unproductive use of finance in global speculative markets. Okay, next question, can these changes be made within um, our existing economic order? I've argued before in my Capitalism, the Future of Illusion, that rather than seeing capitalism as some coherent and fundamentally unchanging system that's utterly resistant to restructuring, it's more appropriate to think of it as analogous to one of those um, buildings from the 14th, 15th, magnificent buildings from the 14th, 15th or 16th century, like Downton Abbey, the, the actual building that the family lived in. It was built centuries ago but it's constantly being redesigned and remodeled. The facade, the outside looks the same, but inside and on the roof, things are very different with solar panels, new wiring, new plumbing, new spaces being carved out of the internal. So this is a way of thinking about capitalism. The last big remodel we had was in the 1930s and 40s. We're long overdue for a new remodeling um, and the democratization of habitation uh, would be a critical part of that remodeling job. And, you know, I would stress that even the Financial Times has recognized this um, need for a major remodeling. You know, their current slogan is capitalism, time for a reset. Um, needless to say, those who become extremely rich under the current arrangements aren't gonna roll over and agree uh, to the democratization of habitation. Um, I, in the earlier talk, I emphasized how bizarre and weird is the current um, maldistribution of income and wealth with people like Bezos and Zuckerberg and Musk controlling unimaginable wealth. Um, so the struggle to democratize habitation um, will require the mobilization of powerful social movements um, to achieve a, the necessary redistribution 
of some of that wealth and of and of some of that income um, to facilitate the, this process. So there will be struggle involved. And so the next obvious question is, can um, the project, the goal of democratizing habitation generate such a movement? And my answer here is that I think that it's possible that many of the already existing movements um, that, that flourish um, in many of our countries, movements for immigrate rights, movements against racial oppression, movements for greater housing access, movements for women's rights, uh, movements for um, a more responsive care economy, movements for environmental justice and environmental protection, movements for workers' rights, that all of these diverse movements should be able to recognize each other as engaged in a common struggle to reform and democratize our habitation. Um, that if this kind of weaving together of these diverse movements um, to understand themselves as engaged in a common project of democratizing the habitation um, would create the potential for extremely powerful coalitions to contest um, for power, for change at multiple levels of governance. And I can imagine a scenario in which uh, winning even small victories, you know, at particular levels uh, could generate more momentum for um, the, these kinds of movements, um, winning more resources from the center that then makes possible um, more mobilization at the grassroots in terms of, um, and there's also the possibility in this struggle um, for the kind of fruitful synergy between electoral mobilization and extra parliamentary mobilization for um, movements you know, within the communities and movements um, that focus on, on winning political office. Um, and I would argue that that positive synergy um, was historically necessary for um, previous periods of successful um, reform um, struggles. Um, and then finally, um, this kind of um, movement for the democratization of habitation uh, would be much less vulnerable to being bought off with incremental reforms, precisely because its focus is on collective consumption, that that's what's at stake in democratizing habitation, um, improving habitation um, not just for the individual family, but for communities of, of families. Okay, so this leads me um, to the last issue that I'll talk about briefly, which, which is the kind of staging of, of struggle. Um, so obviously the, this project of democratizing habitation, even if it's not utopian, um, it's a project that's going to take decades. Um, um, even if I'm just giving a name to a movement that already exists in many places, um, it will take a lot of organizing and experimentation to construct uh, the new institutions that are required uh, to create democratic habitation. And this is gonna take time. But the threat of the authoritarian right is immediate and it requires immediate countermeasures. So how do we think about the relationship between these two tasks. So I suggested in the Vienna talk that, um, that to meet the authoritarian challenge is that um, it's essential to build uh, cross-party coalitions in defense of democratic norms and democratic procedures literally popular fronts in defense of democracy that work to reinforce democratic norms and democratic institutions. And we're seeing this you know, play out in uh, Orban's Hungary where the opposition parties uh, have united around a single slate and a single uh, parliamentary challenger um, in the hope that they can um, um, 
overcome the rigged structure of the elections um, that um, the Orban's party has created. In the US, we see this um, um, in the alliance between uh, Democrats and never Trump Republicans, kind of personified by uh, Liz Cheney, who's been um, insisting that the people who engaged in the plot against democracy must be held to account. So I would argue that at the same time that we try to construct these broad popular fronts in defense of democracy and for institutional reforms that will uh, protect uh, democratic institutions and practices from the authoritarian onslaught, um, we also mobilize as large a subset of that popular front um, to begin the fight for decentralized democratization, putting on the agenda, the expansion of resources to governments at the subnational level and the expansion of citizen participation and decisions. So in the US, um, we have a kind of a natural bridge between these tasks in that one of the big fights at the current moment is the fight to um, defend voting rights um, in, in the states. And one of the challenges is that um, we're now going through the, re the redistricting process whereby state legislatures in Republican dominated states are drawing the maps for legislative and congressional seats. Um, and um, they're drawing those maps in such a way as to minimize the power of people of color to um, influence the election outcomes. So um, we are facing kind of in, um, impending disenfranchisement at the local level. That's a natural bridge to kind of raise these deeper questions about how do we rebuild democracy from the, from the bottom up. But I'm gonna um, um, basically um, wrap up here um, and return to the kind of more pessimistic tone of the first uh, lecture. Um, the threat of 21st century authoritarianism and a decline into barbarism, um, I would argue is uh, continues to be uh, very real and very immediate. Um, the path of, of moderate reform or muddling through is not viable whether we call it the democratization of habitation or something else, the only path to safety in my view is the pursuit of radical reforms that deepen and strengthen democratic governance. But I, I will acknowledge that the jury is still out as to whether this counter movement can gain strength uh, quickly enough to disarm the authoritarian threat. Thank you. I'll Thank you very much for your perspective on the possible uh, path out of the crisis and uh, for perspectives on the democratization, on habitation and the counter movements. And I would directly ask Brigitte in the alphabetic order again uh, to comment on your lecture. Thank you very much, Fred Block. Thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to share some thought on in our round referring to Fred Block's most inspiring lecture on his vision of a post-COVID world and the steps to be taken. Uh, I want to make four points and uh, start with the first. First, I share the core elements of the talk uh, Fred Block has given on 11 November in Vienna. Increasing inequalities, the rich getting richer, the poor getting poorer, and the experience of social decline in the working and the middle classes go along with deep polarizations in our societies and make solidarity and caring for instead of competing with each other more difficult. Such developments have opened windows of opportunity for the authoritarian and nationalist turn by which right-wing populism and parties react 
on the economic, political, and social crisis of the last decades. The case of migration policies combined with question of human rights shows the dramatic anti-democratic developments of the last years and their acceptance in parts of the population. Therefore, paths out of the crisis indeed cannot ignore the individual and collective experience of the destructive forces of the 20s and 21st centuries capitalist market societies. I totally agree with this part of Fred Bock's uh, last lecture. Second, I like to add some aspects, uh, starting with the COVID-19 pandemic. The COVID-19 pandemic has increased crises, which had been the results of neoliberal governance and the austerity schemes of the last decades. Just to mention one example, uh, the same uh, Fred already mentioned, the more and more marketized, privatized and reduced health and care sectors are not prepared anymore to deal with such catastrophes and the employees are the ones who suffer as well as the patients. But also the COVID-19 pandemic per se let us once more get an impression of the forces of destruction of capitalism. It can be understood as a disease of civilization and a civilizational cat catastrophe, which is caused by the market-driven commodification of the Polanian fictitious commodity land or nature. As a zoonosis, the emergence of SARS-CoV-2 is caused by the destruction of ecological and social conditions of livelihood. And the pandemic leads to the, their further destruction to health risks, to death, not only, but not at least for those parts of the world population which are not able to protect themselves. This, is, this already shows the significance of Fred Bloch's analysis and I'm fascinated by his proposal to create, construct, and shape a habitation society, which tries to interrupt the spiral set in motion by what Polanyi calls the liberal greed and the blind improvement of the industrial civilization. And the COVID-19 pandemic is also a paradigmatic case of both improvement in the sense of scientific and technological progress to develop the vaccines promising control over the pandemic combined with the political shaping of markets to sell them instead of providing them as public goods. Comparable scientific and econo economic efforts in reconstructing, repairing or developing habitation are missing at the core of the economy by governance. And to be honest, I'm less optimistic that the market-driven vision of a green or ecological capitalism as the contemporary neoliberal project striving for new hegemony will be a promising path out of the crisis. Third, Fred Bloch's vision of path of out of the crisis and towards a post-COVID world focuses on the idea that people participate in creating, constructing, and shaping habitation by developing alternative modes of production and consumption by, in my reading, forms of deliberative democracy and by bridging the existing gap between people's belongings on the one hand and their political representation on the other hand, on all levels from the local to the international global. I totally share Fred Bloch's analysis that only democratic participation and as 
Axel Honneth calls it historic experimentalism instead of centralism give people the chance to develop and realize their own ideas of habitation and to build those alliances they need to be heard. This idea is close to what Polanyi describes in Freedom in a Complex Society, the last chapter of his masterpiece, The Great Transformation, as the right to nonconformism instead of the liberal, and I want to add the neoliberal idea of individual freedom connected to the so called homo economicus. The right to nonconformism is the flip side of what. Axel Honneth calls social freedom instead of individual freedom at cost of others. But my first and last point in Polanyi's chapter, freedom in a complex society, planning, steering, regulating, controlling the economy are not less important. As we call it in the International Karl Polanyi Society, putting the economy in its place. From my perspectives, this also means that paths towards a post COVID world, breaking with the authoritarian consolidation or neoliberal greenwashing of capitalism, with the blind improvement and with social polarization, will not be possible without extending principles of deliberative democracy to the economy. I totally agree with Fred Block's analysis that we need new forms of investment, tax systems, and many more he talked about to guarantee infrastructures and innovation in the fields of education, of health, of care, and the many fields he already talked about it. And we need as well these innovations in the sense of redistribution to create, construct and shape habitation and to enable all people to contribute. But this will not be possible without new forms of ownership co-determination in German mitbestimmung, co-determination is not exactly the same, participation and control in the economic sector. Democratic habitation will not be possible without a democratic economy or in Polanyi's words, industrial de democracy. Elon Musk organized a Twitter voting about his idea to sell parts of his Tesla shares to be able to pay taxes because as an entrepreneur and shareholder, he does not earn a salary, he told to his voters. To be honest, this kind of water, uh, voting, this is not my vision of an economic or industrial democracy. Paths to create, construct and shape habitation by democratic participation at the end only can be successful if they go along with putting the decision making about our production, consumption and socio-ecological reproduction in the hand of the many instead of the few percents, also at the core of the economy and in a global perspective. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Brigitte, for your comment. And I would now directly ask Bernard Kittel for his comment. Hello, good evening, um, Fred. Many thanks for your uh, presentation. And uh, thank you for the opportunity to uh, comment on uh, your talk. Um, given that I intend to show you a couple of numbers, I will uh, share my uh, screen because uh, that makes a presentation a bit uh, simpler. So I, I would like to comment on uh, what I think is the core of your uh, presentation, namely uh, the idea of the democratization of habitation, uh, which you 
um, develop into four uh, requirements uh, for sustainable and resilient uh, society. Um, let me briefly uh, reflect on uh, those four um, requirements and uh, then proceed to some numbers that I would like to present. Um, the first uh, that you mentioned, um, well, before I start, uh, let me say that um, uh, I think that uh, those four dimensions are very, very well taken and uh, important aspects. And as you said yourself, uh, uh, you expect this to be a process of decades, not of years. And I completely share your view. So what I would like to uh, reflect on is uh, just one aspect of each of the uh, four. I think we could have a discussion uh, for a whole evening of each of the four dimensions that you presented. So the localization of government revenues, indeed, um, and I speak about Austria, but uh, I uh, have been informed and I've experienced also that things are quite similar in other European countries. Many local municipalities are hopelessly underfinanced and uh, highly indebted. Uh, so uh, there is a problem in that respect. On the other hand, um, the current crisis uh, has, at least in Austria, shown that uh, it might not be the most efficient approach to uh, re uh, to locate things like health policy at uh, a more local level, and Austria is at the lender level, and uh, traveling from Vienna to lower Austria implies that uh, the rules that you have to abide to uh, with respect to measures against uh, COVID-19 uh, change. Um, and uh, if you travel further on to Styria or Upper Austria, they change again. Uh, so there's, there's a big uh, uh, differentiation uh, in respect where, uh, as an ordinary citizen, as a, you wonder why that should be necessary. Um, so it, it's a challenge. I wouldn't say that it is insurmountable, but uh, it's something that uh, needs to be kept in mind when thinking about uh, uh, the localization of uh, uh, revenues. Uh, the second point, the credit policy, um, uh, again, indeed, important issue, in particular uh, um, subsidies for ecological uh, innovations, uh, which, by the way, uh, are quite extensive in Austria. Uh, I am not sure whether uh, current in the current situation, uh, um, even lower interest rates are needed uh, if you want to finance a, 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 a house uh, at the moment, you pay roughly 1% interest rate. And I, I'm not sure whether it can be any lower. Um, so affordable credits, um, uh, necessary, but um, dependent on the um, uh, the, the, the situation, whether it is uh, required in a particular period in time. Uh, inclusive coverage of basic needs. Indeed, again, in Austria, we have uh, many fundamental provisions for unemployed and workers. From an Austrian perspective, it's always too little. Um, but uh, from an international uh, comparative perspective, uh, it's not as bad as one might think uh, from a parochial view. Um, but if uh, I reflect on what you said on this topic, uh, the, um, or the, the innovative part might be uh, what is currently discussed under the heading of universal uh, basic income. Uh, uh, programs. Well, here um, my um, research on uh, experimental or my experimental research on uh, distributive procedures, um, like much work in that uh, respect, um, questions uh, to what extent uh, a program like uh, universal basic income is sustainable in a society 
which builds on a very fundamental principle of human interaction. That's uh, what, what we find in experiments, namely the extreme importance of reciprocity for human interaction. And so any program uh, that um, you want to be sustainable needs to keep in mind uh, how it deals with uh, expectations of reciprocity uh, in that respect. Um, with respect to the fourth, uh, participatory government, um, again, uh, important, relevant, but the, 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 the problem is in the detail. Um, and let me briefly refer to a project that I've uh, um, uh, been involved in uh, in an earlier life when I was at the University of Oldenburg. Uh, I um, accompanied the municipality of Oldenburg in uh, a participatory budgeting uh, experiment. And the, the major problem that uh, these people were confronted with was a very biased representation of the population. The problem is you cannot force people to participate. Um, and uh, typically, uh, a very special sort of people uh, engages in this kind of um, project, uh, which implies that only part of the interests in the local population are actually uh, represented in discussions. So these are just a few minor thoughts on uh, on. on potential problems that one might um, encounter when uh, thinking about how to uh, operationalize and implement uh, ideas that I think are very important and actually necessary to implement. Um, so far, my own thoughts. Um, I think uh, it might be interesting, and that's actually what I was asked to do, is to um, have a different look at these four dimensions of uh, your uh, requirements uh, from the perspective of the uh, of people. Um, and uh, I'm in uh, a position to say a few things, although the Austrian Corona Panel Project, which I direct at the moment, um, is uh, not targeted at these kind of questions. Um, we have some items that uh, might be interesting to look at when thinking about uh, how to implement these. The Austrian Corona Panel Project is a representative online panel survey with uh, 1,500 respondents in each wave. And we can probably say that 20% of them, 300, uh, have participated in all 26 waves since we started in March 2020, um, which doesn't sound much uh, from a, a general perspective, but uh, which is uh, a very uh, good retainment rate. Uh, if you think that these people need to go through an unnerving questionnaire once a month. Um, uh, and so we replenish re uh, and most of those who were involved in the first uh, wave uh, came back several times, so we can also say something in, with respect to the development of these. Now, let me briefly go through uh, the four dimensions localization of government tax revenues. We have an item uh, that asks people, at what level do you think the following policy areas should be mainly decided, European, national or local? Now, looking at uh, the shares of uh, respondents who opted for local in a set of policy areas, and we asked that question in September 2020, then we observed that agricultural is the only area uh, where a noteworthy, almost a third uh, a portion of the population would argue the local level is uh, suited for that. Uh, um, health policy, where we have a strong localization, only 17%. Well, that's also an impression of the COVID crisis. Tax policy, um, however, uh, gets only 14%. Uh, I didn't show you all the, um, uh, the dimensions here, but it's among the lowest 
of all. So tax policy at the local level is not necessarily a very popular issue in the population. And so that needs to be kept in mind if you want to localize uh, taxing. Um, and uh, the problem with uh, taxing at the national level and then spending at the local level is the typical principal agent problem. Um, here's another question. The competences of the federal states uh, in the health sector make it more different, difficult to cope with the corona crisis. Uh, completely agree or agree uh, between a fourth and a third. So um, actually, people don't think what I think, that uh, uh, federalism is a problem in this area. OK, these were uh, two questions that relate to the localization. Let's look at affordable credits for sustainable investments. Uh, we have question about um, uh, measures to combat climate change uh, and, for example, to subsidize uh, renewable energies by reducing value-added taxes. This is a quite popular policy, uh, more than a third uh, um, now, more than two thirds of uh, the population seems to be in favor of that. Introducing a CO2 tax for companies, uh, about half of the population would uh, think this is uh, uh, suitable. Now, let's look at the coverage of basic uh, needs. How should the Austrian federal government preserve jobs in the coming 10 years? Um, well, actually, um, this is not really uh, preserving jobs. But pay uh, a basic income to all citizens, uh, depending on whether they work or not. We find that uh, a bit more than a quarter of the population agrees. While uh, guarantee employment with income covering basic needs to all, all unemployed citizens, they're uh, about 50% agree. So. Um, it's uh, much more uh, popular uh, to uh, support people who are unemployed, meaning that they are on the labor market, whereas uh, whether people work or not. And here uh, comes up that uh, topic of reciprocity that I mentioned uh, based on experimental research that um, Apparently, citizens uh, or many citizens expect people who are in a dire condition to um, invest themselves into uh, getting out of that condition. Finally, participatory uh, government, the force of your four uh, dimension, uh, we actually, I, I realized when I looked through our questionnaire that uh, we have little on this. Uh, an item that comes closest to uh, what one could think of an element of participatory government. We must do more to promote a diverse and open society. Um, a bit less than 50% uh, agrees with uh, this uh, statement. So all in all, this is um, a, a, not a very optimistic scenario um, that most of or there's little support uh, overall, with exceptions for particular dimensions in the population for this kind of uh, proposals. And uh, in order to uh, first develop uh, such proposals, uh, one needs to do much work of uh, persuasion. Now, I have a final. Uh, uh, um, remarks, um, what do people actually expect? Um, and here we have an, a set of items stemming from the question uh, referring to what would people think happen after the crisis? Well, everything will resume its normal course. Well, two thirds, the reverse, um, does not agree with uh, this statement. So people think that, uh, uh, that, that, that life will change. Um, however, uh, they don't expect to turn the life around themselves. So it's the others to change. And oneself will stick to what uh, they uh, are doing, um, which 
is quite typical um, uh, in, as a finding that uh, I myself, I don't want to be bothered by what happens, but everybody else should uh, adjust to the situation. And here's a final slide. Uh, so the picture is a final slide. Um, it is about changes in lifestyle due to the COVID-19 crisis. Um, I'm, uh, I, uh, the, the question uh, whether people are willing to change their lifestyle. And uh, here we see all the ways that, uh, no, it's not all the ways, it's a monthly um, uh, picture. Um, and you can see that in March 2020, so in the first days of the crisis, almost 80% agreed that they uh, want to change their lifestyle, but that's quickly uh, dissipated. And now it's less than 50% who think that they would do that. And it's only they think to do that. There's this big step to whether they change anything in practice later on. Um, uh, for example, would they be willing to accept uh, higher taxes to contain the corona crisis? Well, 20%, not even 20% agree. Um, however, on the, on the other hand, their own behavior doesn't seem, or they think that it doesn't um, uh, depend on what other people do. And uh, we have another indicator asked in a, several, uh, in a set of um, waves uh, whether um, they observe other people to be willing to change their lifestyle. Well, that's even less than they think themselves. Again, uh, optimism bias uh, toward their own behavior. So I threw a couple of numbers uh, at you. Uh, thank you for uh, listening. And I'm curious about uh, Fred, but you, uh, your comment on this. So let me stop the presentation. Yes, thank you very much for the entails, the interesting entails in the Austrian Corona panel and the findings on the topic we are discussing, topics we are discussing today. So first now I would give Fred Block the opportunity to react to what Brigitte and Bernhard Kittel were commenting. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I, I've appreciated both sets of comments, but they, they leave me in a somewhat awkward position because in some ways, um, Brigitte was um, criticizing me for not um, sufficiently emphasizing um, that the democratization of habitation requires the full democratization of the economy, uh, the breaking of the, of the power of um, employers and, um, Bernard was um, essentially criticizing me for um, ideas which um, probably don't resonate with even you know the relatively progressive citizenry of um, of Austria. I mean, certainly more progressive than the citizenry of my own country. So um, I guess um, what I would um, <clears throat> what I would um, say is that um, I, I'm um, kind of very specifically um, have kind of opted for this rhetoric around the democratization of habitation. Um, and I, I, I say this elsewhere that um, kind of in contrast to um, the, the rhetoric of socialism, I, I I have this, this feeling that part of the reason that the rhetoric of the of socialism doesn't doesn't resonate um, is precisely because uh, kind of under the um, umbrella of neoliberalism, um, the state and private business are essentially co-producing. Um, much of what we what we consume. I mean that the uh, certainly financial services. It's obvious that this is a collaboration between central banks and private banks. Um, but the internet, you know, was obviously um, created by the U.S. government, and it kind of created the infrastructure in which the a uh, huge. Um, 
um, expansion of, of wealth and the um, dangers of social media were constructed. Um, but, you know, it extends to healthcare, it extends to many of the things that, that people consume, that um, it, it's not as though the state um, now lies outside of the production of much of what we consume. It is, uh, it has been integrated into it in on the terms of, of private capital. And in that context, I think that the, the, the rhetoric of, of socialism um, fails to resonate with people because um, the rhetoric of socialism says the, the public um, will displace the private, but because the public and the private are now intertwined in neoliberal production, um, that doesn't seem like um, an obvious solution to, to many people. And so um, I think that one can essentially get to the same place um, that um, essentially I see, I mean, part of the reason that I'm proposing the democratization of habitation as a decade long project is that um, the end point of that democratization isn't clear at the starting end. It, it might, uh, it could very well uh, lead us past um, the existence of any um, production for profit. But I don't know. I mean, I just, that it's a question of opening up to that process of change through which uh, people struggle to gain greater control over that, their habitation. Um, in some respects, you know, like the internet and the social media, it's obvious that part of that project has to be to regain um, some democratic control over um, those corporate entities. Um, but whether that takes the form of the end of private capital or not, I, I see as a kind of historical question. So in, in responding to um, Bernard, I guess I would make a similar point in that um, I, I deliberately didn't use the language of basic income. I, you know, um, um, use the language of putting a floor under, under people by providing them with housing and healthcare um, and some level of economic security. Uh, but um, I, envision you know a process of, of organizing where um, one changes some of this existing public opinion in the in the process of persuading people that the marginalization of segments of the population um, isn't in their own interest I mean that we could have um, we could have um, um, habitation with less crime, less danger, less um, 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 less of um, various kinds of undergrounds um, through a, a politics of inclusion. So I'm, I mean, I, so the last point I'll make just um, is that yes, um, one of the issues that, that Bernard raised is, um, very um, important, and I jumped over it too quickly, which is that um, that I'm not arguing that all decisions should be pushed down to the local level, that um, I'm talking about um, strengthening um, democracy at the local level, but there are very complicated issues of playing out um, what is the relationship between and the responsibilities of these different levels of, of governance. And most importantly, we face the problem of um, protecting people's rights. In, in other words, that if we devolve more power to local levels, um, we can easily imagine situations where um, at, at the, the local level, there's more exclusion, more 
um, victimization of certain um, marginal populations and so forth. So we're talking about uh, an extremely complex problem of uh, coordinating different levels of governance um, to give people more authority over their own habitation, uh, but also establishing some kinds of, of limits and um, a foundation of democratic rights that um, protects more vulnerable populations. Um, and with something like healthcare, um, that obviously you can't devolve all policy down to the to the local level or you get the checkerboard nightmare that we talking about with um, COVID. So one of the um, parts of the experimentation is um, creating kind of um, new channels um, of bringing issues um, to the, the central level and um, processes of negotiation um, where um, the, the decentralized entities um, have more voice in the um, development of centralized policies, but that there's a kind of um, give and take and back and forth and a kind of a complicated negotiated process, which you know, you Europeans are familiar with in terms of the um, nightmare of the European communities um, coordination mechanisms. Thank you very much. So um, now is the opportunity for the audience to ask questions. As I said before, please raise your hand or place a dot in the chat. Thank you very much for all the different perspective of our um, speakers tonight. Uh, I think it was pretty interesting to get the insights on ideas and perspective of the democratization of habitation, also from different national perspective, but also different theoretical um, perspectives. Um, and also in different kinds of optimistic ways and pointing at different potentials. So are there questions from the audience? I think um, the last point that Block um, was pointing out is pretty interesting. Um, the different levels of governance and how it will work out and you also, because if there's no question, I will ask a question. Uh, and I can't see a question yet. Uh, the different levels of governance are pretty interesting in how they should um, should like coordinate and then what is the duty of which level of governance. It's pretty interesting. And I think it's even more interesting uh, if you connect it to a point you made uh, in your talk before, because you talked of a coalition between the movements. And I think it's pretty difficult also to build this coalition of the movements and all. And on top of that, to navigate this coalition over the different levels um, of governance, do you have any optimistic ideas how that might work or um, any flagship ideas? I, I know it's a big question, but uh, yeah, it would be interesting for me if you had any thought, thought on that too. Um, right, no, that um, the, this is... Um um gets um complicated and and difficult very very quickly um I, I guess um um what um one of the kind of um models that i have in mind of um a place where kind of i mean the that they don't talk about it they don't use the rhetoric of democratization of habitation but um, the example is um, the development of the social and solidarity economy in, in uh, Montreal and Quebec in, in general. And um, this was uh, um, a political initiative um, from below um, that began as a, a kind of coalitional effort that brought together uh, trade unions, uh, the organized feminist movement, 
um, and a variety of, of community groups. And um, they, um, they formed a, a powerful grassroots political coalition um, that was then able um, to win uh, a series of reforms from um, both the city government and from the provincial government. Um, and it, another important part of it was that um, they built up, they had the advantage of some already existing and they built up additional financial resources in terms of, of capital funds. And um, the combination of the pressure from um, below and what they were able to win from government and the financial institutions. Um, so one of the kind of um, concrete um, victories um, was a public subsidy for childcare um, at the same time um, that there were the resources uh, to create a network of childcare cooperatives that were able to get the funding that they needed to get underway um, from these various social and solidarity funds that had been created from existing and newly created funds. Um, so you get this kind of very um, concretely the convergence of a public funding policy uh, with the instrument of, of provision um, of the cooperative childcare and as a consequence, you, um, you begin to um, put the local habitation under some greater degree of, of uh, public control. So that, that's kind of the um, political um, uh, pull and push that I'm kind of thinking about in this process of um, forming uh, coalitions that are able to um, extract um, important concessions and um, so forth. I think there might be a question in the chat there as well. Yes, I'm going to read it out aloud. So um, it's a question for Bernhard uh, and Bernhard's movie. Uh, in the con ah, no, not, not only for that, sorry. In the contribution of Bernard's reflection, I would be strengthening universal basic services uh, like public transport, education, housing, better suited to build habitation without entering in conflict with reciprocity, as in the case of universal basic income. That's his question. So, who wants to? Okay, no, that, that um, Bernard has raised uh, um, a, a very um, good, good point here. And, you know, I, I think it is, um, um, you know, an issue which has been um, debate, debated in the basic income movement and Philippe Van Parijs, you know, has famously, um, you know, said that, um, if some people just want to go um, and become ski bums with their basic income um, and travel from um, the one hemisphere to the other um, so they can ski around, um, that, that should be what they do. Um, and obviously that violates um, norms of reciprocity. It violates the uh, deep feeling that many people have that some commitment to the uh, community to others. Um, so I, I guess um, my, um, my view here is that um, most people um, um, want to be um, held to these um, norms of reciprocity. So I, I guess what I would um, opt for is the kind of um, um, very soft work requirement where some degree of public participation um, is a, you know, a precondition for, um, for um, getting the support. And so um, in the case of, of parents of small children that 
participation would be child rearing um, in the case of those who were uh, childless, um, that a certain amount of, of volunteer time uh, with one or another community group uh, would, would suffice. Um, I'm, I recognize that um, um, the demand for publicly created employment um, as the solution um, um, kind of resonates um, with much of the public and, um, um, and that there are kind of significant political groups on the left in the US that have long argued for uh, public employment as the kind of um, mechanism to balance the labor market and so forth. And I strongly um, dissent from that tendency because it seems to me that um, they have a, an argument that public employment should balance the labor market. So the public employment expands during periods of high unemployment and then it contracts um, when um, more private sector jobs are available. And that seems to me ridiculous because if the need is there for more childcare workers or more healthcare workers or, or whatever, um, the employment should be permanent. It's, it's stable employment that provides people um, with um, the resources, the uh, experience of reciprocity that they need. Temporary public sector jobs that um, exist for a while and then go away don't solve that fundamental need. They, you know, they solve a public need to uh, make sure that those people who are getting assistance are doing something, but that it's leaf raking and it doesn't make sense uh, for the people who have to rake the leaves to feel that they're doing work, which really isn't essential, but it's essentially punishment um, that they have to go through in order to get their relief check. So, um, so I'm trying to kind of carve a bit of a middle position there in, in terms of that tension. Thank you very much for the answer of the question. Do Bernhard or Brigitte want to add anything? Well, let me just briefly add, uh, in Austria, we are pretty close to universal basic services in this sense. Uh, the education is uh, virtually free of charge. Uh, and housing, in particular Vienna, we have a system there's much public uh, building, although in recent years it has become a bit less. Public transport, uh, the recent uh, move towards the one to three ticket is a move into that direction. Uh, whereas um, I had uh, the opportunity to, 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 to travel a bit in the Austrian countryside and the further you get away from Vienna or the metropolitan areas, uh, the more difficult it becomes to get from A to B in a decent amount of time. Uh, but uh, compared to other countries, I think we're pretty close to that idea. Yes, perhaps a short remark. Uh, uh, I'm uh, not convinced that uh, all these ideas of democratization, the economy, will uh, lead, us, uh, lead us to socialism. Uh, I'm uh, very modest uh, at the moment uh, when I'm looking to uh, the neoliberal governance and the market fundamentalism of the last years. But I think that uh, democratic habitation and uh, it's a really great sympathy of on my side for it uh, needs uh, support not only uh, by the people not only by the political representatives but only by a kind of redistribution uh, which is more that uh, than we experience at the moment absolutely yeah no i i i completely agree with that and that um that without um um yeah without uh taxing these vast accumulations of wealth then um and and um erecting um new structures of taxation that 
prevent the um, the hiding of of wealth in offshore and um, and in the latest re revelations we find that uh, one of the biggest tax havens in the world is South Dakota and um, um, that you know Americans are hiding their wealth in in South Dakota and avoiding taxes and um, this is uh, utterly um, ridiculous and you know that um, as somebody once said that taxation is the price we pay for civilization and that uh, the expansion of the tax havens and the tax avoidance is a direct and immediate threat to the continuation of civilization and um, we need we urgently need a, um, a powerful collective response and um, I haven't studied the South Dakota issue but um, it, yeah, it, um, you know, it, I mean, part of what's so troubling um, is that those areas in the U.S., like South Dakota, you know, the Dakotas were um, bastions of prairie populism and a kind of hatred of big business and, um, um, and, you know, now they're, um, they're, protecting themselves from economic disaster by creating havens for the ultra wealthy. And it's, um, it, it's unacceptable and unsustainable. Yeah, and I think that's a bit pretty important point for Europe and for Austria too. Um, for example, in Austria, there has been an initiative in, in Germany to tax me now by a young um, heirs uh, who will uh, inherit a lot of uh, millions and millions. And in Austria, for example, you don't have any taxation on that. If you're an heir, you will get, get all the money, all the capital um, without any taxation. And, and there's also, there are some initiatives who point on that because there is need for the redistribution and it's obvious. I think it's pretty, important point you all made. So are there any further questions from the audience? I've obviously settled all of these issues. So, so. so if there aren't any further questions, I uh, would like to thank uh, you three again, Bernhard Kittel and Brigitte Aulenbacher for their comments and especially um, Fred Block for being here. Although it's only online, we really uh, enjoy having you and enjoyed having you um, for the um, Vienna uh, visiting professorship. Um, uh, Karl Polanyi Visiting Professorship, which is a project of the University of Vienna, the Vienna University of Economics and Business, the Central European University, the International Karl Polanyi Society, and the Volkshochschule Wien, which is supported also by the Vienna Chamber of Labor and the City of Vienna. Thank you very much for the perspective um, on um, the path uh, on the path out of the crisis and the envisioning of a post-COVID world, which uh, was pretty inspiring, I think, for, for everyone in the audience. And um, thank you very much for your time and all um, the insights. And yes, I hope, you, I hope the optimistic perspective is the right perspective. The future will show it to us, but I... I hope it's like that <laughs> because there's a need for optimism, I think, in times like that. So thank, thank you, you so much, Fabian, for organizing this and thank you for the comments and um, um, thank you to all who attended, both my friends and the students in my class and my other colleagues. So thank you. Yeah, thank you very much.
Well, we will meet uh, tomorrow, I think, at the public university and the Central Uni uh, European University. So have a good evening and yeah. we will see you tomorrow. Okay. I'm going to get very little sleep. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Bye bye. Thank you bye -bye. so much. Bye bye. Okay.